Today I'm visiting the community of Bowmanville, located on the shores of Lake Ontario in traditional Mississauga territory. It's early spring and the lake waters are on the rise. We've never seen the lake get that high, and we had actually already been to our council the year before the flooding to say we are so compromised now from the uh, St. Mary's Pier that there's no protection left between us and the lake. We told our council it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. There is going to be a disaster down in our community. Our lives changed uh, on April 30th, 2017. That was the first storm event that we experienced last spring. On April 30th, we called 911. The waves were coming over the rock wall. Water was coming in, stones were being thrown up. They were hitting the windows of our house. And uh, the first responders show up. Four big, strong, strapping guys in a fire truck. They don't know what to do. They're standing at their fire truck at, up at the road. My wife's going, why aren't you helping my husband? From the, the get-go, of course, we didn't know what we were getting into that first storm, but the, the residents down here sort of got flooded two ways. Lake was high, they had the lake flooding, but behind them they've got a marsh. The, um, you know, the groundwater feeding to the marsh off uh, the, you know, up the watershed uh, hit them from the back as well. So that was probably the most surprising, you know, flooding from one angle is fine, but you were getting it from both ends. I think that the, uh, the fire department and the chief is uh, exceptionally engaged. I think uh, operations are engaged. I still think that the politicians are not taking it as ser seriously as they should. As far as the, uh, the mayor and the regional councillor, they haven't been there. They've been asleep at the switch. Um, down here, um, it was, I've never seen anything like houses and look like they were in the middle of the lake. Just, we knew that it wasn't just the rains. There was something else that was wrong last year. And, um, you know, when we looked into it and got to hear from some experts, found out that not only does um, the plan 2014, but also climate change. This is, you know, drastically affecting Clarington and our Lake Ontario shoreline. In 2017, the governments of Canada and the USA brought in a new management plan for Lake Ontario called Plan 2014. Plan 2014 calls for Lake Ontario to have higher highs and lower lows to accommodate the hydroelectricity and shipping industries. In spring 2017, Lake Ontario reached its highest recorded level ever. I think the story that needs to be told is less about where we live and more about the decisions that we've been living with and the inactions that we've been facing uh, from our government elected officials. For the past few years, the shoreline residents have had their backs pushed against the wall by all three levels of government, while the waters of Lake Ontario have been steadily rising and are now knocking on their doors. In the 1970s, the Government of Ontario approved the construction of a deep water shipping pier despite warnings that it would eventually completely erode the beaches and the protective shorelines. The government next approved the construction of a giant quarry that destroyed 50% of the protective marsh and wetlands that were instrumental in flood prevention. These decisions, coupled with the implementation of Plan 2014 have left homeowners vulnerable to the amplified effects of climate change and flooding. You know, what really struck me is it's not that people weren't given warning. We all knew it was coming. We didn't know it would come so hard and so fast um, because on top of that, uh, you know, Plan 2014 changed how the lake gets regulated. Prior to our flooding in 2017, I didn't even know the lake was regulated. Most people do not understand that Lake Ontario outflows, so the water running out of Lake Ontario is controlled by human beings. Um, so there is nothing natural about the level of Lake Ontario. Plan 2014, in my opinion, does not seem to be adequate to manage the lake. And while I respect the opinion that we can't control the weather, and there may always be flooding events, the plan of control was changed without 
in my opinion, due regard for the people, the riparian landowners. So we are expected to deal with the outcomes of that without any support from our federal, provincial or municipal governments uh, to aid us. We could see the waters rising and three or four residents sent emails to the Conservation Authority, sent emails to our city to say, what's the plan? The waters are rising, New York is underwater, they've declared a state of emergency. And we were told that they'd get back to us and nobody got back to us. Um, so when the waters first hit, um, there had been no preparations, there'd been no conversations, there'd been no mitigations, no uh, you know, emergency plans put in place. So when I first made that phone call, um, it, took, um, it took a couple of hours for the, the emergency management coordinator to arrive. And when he arrived, um, he literally looked at me and said, I'm sorry, but this really isn't my problem. And I, I can't even begin to tell you the impact that had on me. What do you mean this isn't your problem? If this was a community that had a forest fire bearing down on it, would you stand in the front lawn of somebody's home and say, this really isn't my problem? Right? Every home is a private home. But if there's an earthquake, a train derailment, a forest fire, we help. But here we were being told that we are private homeowners and therefore this is our responsibility. One of the things that I, I think was, was obvious too from the get-go was the fact that there was a, a real absence of any kind of coordination or leadership with respect to the volunteer activity. We had no single voice communicating that need. We had no person specifically designated to organize people who were showing up. And I actually went and, and tried to volunteer. I wanted to see how the process worked because to me it didn't seem very organized. And I went to the truck, I knocked on the door and I said, hi, you know, my name's Corinna, I'm here to, I'm here to help, how do I sign up? And this was after, you know, four different locations had been conveyed to me as to where even this, this, this trailer was, this truck. And when I got into the truck, nobody had any idea what I was there for. You know, in spite of the messaging that was being put out for the municipality, in reality, I think there were some major deficiencies and some major issues with respect to how things were happening. The people who live in this area are senior citizens, persons living with disabilities, and families with young children. The elected government officials ignored their constituents' pleas for help and publicly attempted to minimize the situation. Despite several warnings, the municipality was completely unprepared to deal with an event of this magnitude, and first responders had no formal training in dealing with a landscape-level flood. And as a result of poor planning, the municipality did not have enough pumps or sandbags on hand to hold back the lake waters, ultimately putting everyone in harm's way. When sandbags finally arrived, Many of the bags were old and falling apart, and the sand provided by the municipality contained high levels of road salt, which leached into the water table, killing vegetation and compromising the local drinking water. Last spring, on all that bad flood we had, I had to get help from so many people around this neighborhood to help me with, uh, when I just I couldn't lug anymore, I couldn't lift anymore. We are senior citizens. Um, we're retired on pension, and uh, this is really devastating to us. I'm, I'm, I'm in debt to the bank. I, I, every month I can hardly keep out of the red. On the other side of the lake, her Governor Como helped New Yorkers uh, along the uh, Lake Ontario that had damage, um, helped them financial recovery. But we have tried, not just me, other people on this uh, street have tried the, uh, the mayor of Clarington, we've tried the um, provincial rep, the federal rep. We have tried all three levels of government for help. They just said, it's not our problem, try somebody else. <laughs> there is nobody else to try, there's just the three of you. Since May of 2017, we have lived in a lot of fear. Um, I've had some depressive episodes because of it where I'm not functioning too well because I keep picturing what's going to happen and, and how are we going to handle it. Uh, it's not a very nice way to live. We've always done things by the book. We've always had permits for anything we've had to do. And it just seems really irresponsible that 
you get the runaround when you approach any of these levels of government. I personally uh, went into the provincial agency's office here in Bowmanville because the person was not, Mr. Granville was not returning my calls. Simply sent me back to the mayor. And when I spoke to the mayor, he sent me back to Mr. Granville. This is not why we vote people in. We vote people in so that if we in an, are in a situation that requires assistance to the community, to the people that have voted you in, then you shouldn't have it to be getting the runaround. And that's what it is. It's a total runaround. The first thing we heard when this occurred was, well, you live down there, as if living down here now keeps you open to any kind of disaster that happens, like living near a fire area. That's your fault somehow. Um, I found that really, really difficult to hear. Every time you hear large waves coming in and you're, you're on edge because you're not sure what they're going to bring, uh, you go to, to bed at night and you hear the waves and you have no idea if you're going to wake up to flooding. Uh, you constantly watching weather reports. Uh, so there's, there's been a, an emotional toll as well. Well, I think they certainly need to recognize that we need the help and that we cannot fight a lake and a conservation area on the other side on our own. They, they certainly need to step up, they need to recognize it, they need to offer us educated and professional advice on the best way to protect ourselves and the financial support to do it. This home has been in the family since uh, the 1930s and we've seen a, a lot of um, shoreline go missing. We didn't build near the water. The day I had an eye operation, I came home on the day of my eye operation to my f basement being flooded. I wasn't supposed to bend, lift, push anything, but I had to, you know, I, it, and we're, we're seniors. So we had all of that going against us, yet we were left to ourselves to have to try to protect our property. Uh, after the uh, flood of last year, last summer, I've never seen a frog, never seen a turtle, never seen a snake. Everything's changed. We had a, a rabbit actually this morning up on our back deck. So I guess with the water levels being up as high as they are right at the moment, that uh, even the rabbit burrows must be underwater again and they're coming up on the back deck to try and dry out and get a little sunshine. So it's, they've got to make changes. It's, it's got to stop. These higher highs, uh, they've got to put a cap to it. Stop drowning the people. Flooding is the number one threat in Ontario, number one threat in Canada. It is the number one cost to government in recovery. It is the number one cost to banks, the number one cost to insurance companies. Yet, there's no public education on what you should do as a homeowner. Floods are the costliest natural disaster in Canada in terms of property damage. They are also the most common Canadian natural disaster, with about 40% of floods occurring in April and May. One of the surprises to me was, oh, we can't come on your property and, and protect your house. We can deliver sandbags, but you have to fill them and you have to place them. Well, we depend on our first responders to really support that. No, I just use the analogy, if my house is burning down, I pay my taxes, I kind of expect them to show up and not help me put it out, take over incident command, rescue people, and do what they can to save the situation. And I felt in flooding for most of it, that was not either provided or maybe even able to be provided. Because honestly, I don't feel like they knew anything more about it than, than we knew. I, I also, think that they weren't super well prepared. Noticed firemen down on the beach, heavy bunker gear, placing sandbags. If they, if they had got swept into the water when something like that was coming in, there's all that bunker gear, no life jackets, no life preservers, they would have been probably gone. For the past few years, many regions in Canada have been experiencing more frequent and extreme weather events, resulting in higher levels of flooding. In 2017, researchers from the University of Waterloo surveyed 2,300 Canadians, all of whom were living in areas deemed to be high risk under the Federal Flood Damage Reduction Program. They found that 94% of survey respondents were not aware that their houses were at risk of being flooded and were not sufficiently prepared. In Canada, we have no national strategy 
that property owners can access to better understand flood risk. The research also concluded that homeowners are relying on floodplain maps that are outdated and inconsistent. Flood risk maps for individual municipalities are usually available to the public, but these may be incomplete, out of date, and hard to find. Municipalities may even be hesitant to release the maps publicly. There's a concern that if people find out their risk, property values will decrease. Well, when it first like started flooding, I was really nervous. I was going to kind of lose my home. Once more help came, it was like, okay, this might be a bit better. Still now, it's kind of a worry. First days when there wasn't as many people helping out, uh, I was mainly like uh, at the beach with like all the waves crashing and laying all the sandbags. Then after when there's more firefighters and stuff, I was more um, making the sandbags, like putting the sands in them and in the fire lines, passing them out to the firefighters. Getting the call and coming down, I expected a flood, but not what it was like. It was a lot worse. And uh, we get down here and work a few hours and just keep going and the next day would be the same and it seemed like we were never making progress because it would just you'd build up the walls, they'd get knocked down and you'd have to come up with something better to try to keep the water out. People talk about, the, uh, about Hurricane Hazel uh, and, and how it devastated uh, Toronto back in the 50s, but even when that happened, this area did not get flooded. Uh, so in the hundred years plus that there's been a community down here, there has never been a major flood event such as what happened last year. It was only until various man-made um, structures were built, namely the dam at Cornwall that, helped, that enables them to then raise and lower water levels in Lake Ontario and that St. Mary's Pier that flooding has ever been an issue here. A hurricane caused the worst flood in Ontario's history. Hazel hit Toronto on October 14, 1954, taking 81 lives and causing an estimated $150 million in damages. We all know that if the water levels get to a certain height, uh, there will be flooding and you won't be able to stop it with any structure. The, the water level will get up over top of it. But that's not the point. The point is that there are ways of protecting against destructive wave action even when you're not in flood conditions. Uh, that is what is needed here. Uh, one way communities are adapting, as I said, is we're, we're learning better in terms of where we, where we should be building. Uh, we're also learning about um, ways in which we can help mitigate these, these uh, risks of flooding and erosion and uh, wetlands, we mentioned that already, is a good example of, of a way that communities can help minimize or adapt to climate change. Wetlands are, are a perfect green infrastructure, if you will. They're, they naturalize, store water in, in, a, in a rain event and release it slowly so it helps mitigate the risk of flooding significantly within our community. So we're starting to learn more about the importance of wetlands from that point of view and the need to protect them. We're also learning about other new standards or related to infrastructure as you mentioned in terms of bridges and culverts again to make sure that they're sized appropriately to to be able to accommodate this increase in water from the increased precipitation that we see from climate change. The silos are a huge problem because you know the works department works on managing the physical infrastructure, the planning department works on planning for the future, the finance department <laughs> controls the financing for all of that and what we have to do is cut across those sort of silos. We have to say to people, it's no longer sufficient just to plan for what you know today. You have to plan for what's coming in the future. In this region, we put that infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the culverts, the major buildings, all of that was put in place basically in the 60s and 70s. And it was designed then for the weather and the climate that we were experiencing then. That's no longer what we're experiencing. That's 50 years ago, almost, and we need to upset normal ways of doing things. We need to build bridges differently. We need to build roads differently. We need to build our houses and our buildings differently. Um, you know, we have a habit in this part of the world of putting black roofs on buildings. You know, every new house going up has got a dark roof on it. That's just contributing to the urban heat island effect. Um, 
If you look at southern countries, they have white roofs and white walls, and they've learned that that's how you reflect incoming solar radiation. So just, you know, a simple little example of changing from the conventional black roof on a house or a, a flat roof on a commercial building to a reflective or white roof. That's one of the simple changes we're trying to get. 11% of the world's population, some 800 million people, are currently vulnerable to climate change impacts such as droughts, floods, heat waves, extreme weather events, and sea level rise. But basically, we've taken carbon that's been locked away underground for millennia, and we've burnt it and released it to the atmosphere, and we're going back to the sort of climate of the dinosaur era. Um, extremely hot, extremely high levels of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere, which drives that heat. Um, it's pretty simple science. You learn some a lot of this in grade nine science um, about incoming solar radiation, black surfaces, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, it's fairly simple stuff, but you have to acknowledge that there is change and we're the cause of that change. It's not spontaneous, it's not happening naturally. It's happening because we humans are driving it. Without the public, and without the public raising hell over this issue, we would not see the increase in response that we do now from the emergency services and hopefully from the politicians um, to follow. We're looking to levels of government and conservation authorities because they're the ones who did grant the legal permits to go ahead and do these things that have had this man-made impact. Um, and it's not rocket science how to fix this. So the engineering is not that difficult. Um, and other jurisdictions have responded much more quickly, especially in the United States, to you know, bringing in the barges and the construction materials once you have a design and getting it done. And uh, I would sure like to see that for the people down here, that they don't have to lose their homes. Uh, because if it gets much worse, that's where we are. Uh, we're going to have to move away. I'd like to hear more from our municipal representatives and, you know, personally hear from them and, and talk to them about what to do. I mean, but it would be nice to be able to talk directly to them and, and for them to genuinely listen and not just give, um, you know, not, not just talk and say, yes, yes, that's too bad, you know. Um, I'd like to see action personally through, through the politicians. Imagine if this was your home and you were in the same situation with your parents, with your children, your grandchildren, your, um, your senior relatives, uh, living in this situation and trying to fight Lake Ontario. We are fighting something that is not of our making. All right, we didn't build a pier out into the lake. We didn't change the flow of water in Lake Ontario uh, through the dam. We um, are still having to deal with the effects of all of that. We had no say in any of that decision. Nobody asked us if we wanted the water levels changed. Nobody asked us if we wanted a pier built out. Um, but we have to deal with the after effects of that. And uh, to have no support and no compensation for the damages done by that is really hard. If, if I had a, an opportunity to, to give one message to Prime Minister Trudeau, it's, it's that um, you really have to start looking at the responding to the climate change issue as a priority that is a lot more important really for all of us and especially for our children and our children's children. Um, it has to be the priority rather than saying, oh, we have to balance the economy and the, and the environment. Um, we've had about 25 years of that now, that approach, and what it means in practice is we pay symbolic attention to the, to the climate issue, the environment. And in real ways, we just go ahead and put more money into business as usual. Uh, and that's why the, the climate change targets that we're currently seeing out of the 
Trudeau government, for example, are, they're not any closer to being reached than they were under Harper because they, they keep using this balance the environment in the economy. And the economy is going to really go down the tubes uh, for the coming generations if we don't put the environment first. The, the economy depends on the environment. Um, it doesn't really work the other way around, not in the long term. The environment has to be first. So another thing that we've learned coming through this type of emergency is you walk as a, as a vocal uh, you know, advocate trying to fight for change, you walk this very fine line where um, you don't want to be too vocal against the governments that are not responding to you because these are the very same people that when the floodwaters come again, we need their help. But at the same time, you know, if you continue to say that everything is good, that we're making progress, and I think they're really trying very hard, everybody gets let off the hook. So how about we all just start with a culture of right action, remembering that these are the various constituents that elected you into office, that you have a fiduciary duty to actually protect your constituents, and they shouldn't have to beg you for it. Across the country, we're seeing stronger rainstorms, tornadoes, flood events, extreme heat events, all of that sort of thing. Uh, and that's grabbing people's attention. And the floods are coming earlier and earlier. I mean, we had a flood in Southern Ontario in mid-February this year, where that tragically that little boy, three-year-old boy lost his life in that flood in the Grand River. That was the middle of February we had that. So, you know, we're, we're seeing the winter season shortening, the rainy season lengthening, more rain, more intense rain. And that really challenges the infrastructure. The climate has changed, and it's going to change even more drastically. Flooding events like the one in Bowmanville need to be a wake-up call for municipal leaders, community planners, and elected officials of all political stripes. The spring of 2019 is shaping up to be the worst year ever for flooding across many parts of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and for the First Nation community of Kasechewan, located along the James Bay coast. For too long, we've been fueling the needs of our industries at the expense of the environment and the safety of our communities. The climate is changing and we need to change with it. And part of that change will be demanding a higher level of honesty, accountability and transparency from our elected officials because we've run out of time.